memories there. I mean, I brought up the Grateful Dead, and uh, they ended up playing poker on the on, on the Woodstock, air with Scott Muni Myers, for about two hours. This is radio. This was not television. All right? <laughs> so it had to be two of the most boring hours <laughs> in the history. But you know. people still talk about it. Yes. yes. <laughs> people, people still, still do talk but about I, it. I got a story, John. I don't know if you remember this, but, you know, we talked about the uh, concert broadcast. And do you remember the one about Leonard Skinner? Because from, from here or from, from, from the, the capital, capital? From the capital. Because I was very, I'm very good friends with Ray Dariano, who was the MCA promotion guy at the time that represented Leonard Skinner. It was, I think it was their second album. Skinner hadn't gotten a lot of airplay in New York. They were huge in the South, but not much. So I think Peter Rudge managed them at the yes, time. Yes, he absolutely did. The Stones and all no, that other stuff. Yeah. And, and he came up with this idea of NEW should do a broadcast with Leonard Skinner. It'll be a win for everybody because Skinner will get a lot of promotion on NEW and airplay. John's show will sell out, right? And, and so it would break them up north where they weren't as popular as they were down in the south. Right, right. So everybody called everybody and got it all worked out and paid for and NEW got some extra ads for uh, the record of Skinner and all this stuff. John got the promotion for the gig. So everything is going swimmingly, and the uh, promotion guy comes to pick up Scott, who was going to MC the show. And they take a limo to the, the lovely Passaic, New Jersey, and, um, and, and uh, you know, the bar behind the Capitol Theater? I forget the name of that bar. There you go. I was say, there's at least 25 or 30 people here. <laughs> well, everybody's been in that bar that went to the Capitol Theater. At least once. At least, yeah. And so... Before uh, the they show, they closed the place before, every night. Before the show, very atypical of Muni, he <laughs> said, ah, "Fats, let's go uh, have a little pop before the show." Uh, so Ray and and Scott go into that bar. Scott's greeted like a hero, and everybody, ah, Muni, and the, the, the show tonight, and, and they're all asking about Skinner, and everything's going exciting. Ray uh, excuses himself at some point, goes over to the Capitol to see, say hello to the band and everything. <laughs> And there was a little trouble going on. Do you remember what the trouble was? <laughs> yes. Okay. What had happened is apparently everybody was big on this broadcast but hadn't bothered to tell the band that they were going to be on a live radio broadcast that night. And Ronnie Van Zant was saying, I ain't going on stage and I ain't doing no live broadcast. Nobody told me about that. All right? So Ray told me that you said you must have had been working the band to try and get everything cool because they were still in the house at the time, right? Yeah. And you said, Ray, you're going to have to take care of this. <laughs> so Ray goes, no problem. So he goes over and he gets Scott, you know, and but this time Scott is like in the center of the room of the bar having a great time and everybody's glad handing him. He couldn't buy a drink for himself. And Ray whispers in his ear, uh, Scott, so we got a little problem here. And, and Scott goes, all right, everybody, party over. Thanks a lot. Show's going to start in a little bit, right? So Ray forms, uh, you know, tells Scott so what's going on on the way walk over, which is what, 50 feet into the back there they go. And uh, so Scott goes in and uh, says to you, uh, we need a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> and, and, you know, he goes to Ronnie and they say, yeah, Ronnie, you need, they know. and Ronnie knew who Scott was and everything like that. Uh, I need a little time with you, Ronnie. <laughs> and, and they go over into some corner and talk for about five minutes, pass the bottle of Jack Daniels back and forth. They're both like slugging like this. After five minutes, they come out arm in arm. All right, let's go. The concert's on. <laughs> and that's a true story. Yeah. And now the final thing was they watch a, a couple of songs. The thing is going on beautifully. Scott gets back in the limo with Ray, and uh, they head back to the city, and they turn on the radio, and Munich goes, eh. Always sounds better on the radio, facts. <laughs> and I think that I think I think that either the last show or the or one of the very final shows, but I think it was the last show that Ronnie Van Zandt ever performed was at Convention Hall. Here, the plane went down like a week later, um, and all these bootleg tapes that are around, there's, there's one of that uh, there. So, uh, yeah, these things happen. You know? yeah. And. John brought the Who to the Capitol Theater. <coughs> yeah. John brought the Rolling Stones to the Capitol Theater. I mean, these incredible shows that took place in that venue, I mean, are just unforgettable. Yeah, well, it became, you know, it, it became a, a venue that, that 
you know, had some sort of mystic powers, and I, and and you know, we, we we invested in good, you know, in good sound and good lights and and video where these things came from and uh, great lights. Moisey uh, responsible for that. Um, we, we had, a, we had we, 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 and we had a we had a great crew that felt like a family. And I think the acts all got that, and they felt comfortable. We talked about psychosis. When the Who played, when they were leaving, uh, Who, had, I think, did two shows. Uh, and when the, Who, when the show was all over, and, you know, in those days, everybody, the acts didn't just, like, run into a limo and leave. They hung. And finally, maybe an hour after the show was over, Bill Kerbishley, uh, who was one of the two managers with, with, with Peter Rudge, was you know trying to get them all into a, into a van, uh, and they couldn't find Roger Dalton. Couldn't find him. Absolutely could not find him. All right, we looked all over the place. Nobody could find Roger Dalton. Townsend's theory was he found a he found a beautiful girl, and he was somewhere with her, and would eventually show up. And uh, so one last sweep of, uh, of 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 the theater before they were going to give up. Um, I can't remember which one of the security guys, but they're probably here tonight. Um, there was a loft backstage where the kitchen was, and, and uh, climbed up the ladder to the loft. And there was a there was a, there was a you know a um, what do you call it? dummies uh, dumbwaiter 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 you know that brought the food down. But the, but but the order the order to get there you had to climb a ladder you know six feet you know or whatever. Um, there was Roger Daltrey sitting on the floor. Uh, of the loft there, talking to Sai and Sai's assistants and getting recipes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Kerber's was going to kill him. <laughs> but, uh, the food was that good. Yeah. It was really I think one of the reasons for the comfort, and you kind of touched on this before, was we were all roughly the same age. Yeah. The musicians, the concert goers, the promoter, and that was very unusual at the time. You think of other managers and, or other concert promoters, it just, it was different, it was, and I think that was a big part of it. Yet at the same time, um, and, and to go back to the relationship that you had with NEW, you were one of the few people, and, and there definitely was a bond between your group, you know, your company and, and the radio station. Hey, I was the pitcher on the soul. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, that's right. Aren't you in the <laughs> calendar? What? Aren't you yeah, one of the, the few people that ever, yes. aside from the staff and <laughs> yes. artists that made it in the WNEW FM charity concert? And it was the Christmas picture, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. But you were one of the few people who could go toe to toe with Muni yes. and not burn the friendship. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. And yes. I don't know if you'll remember this story. I don't remember the exact circumstances, whether Scott was in the studio and on, he was on the phone with you, I know that. I don't know whether it was in the studio and he called you or he was in the office and he put the phone up to the speaker, but it was when Alabama Getaway came out and it was on PLJ. Now PLJ at this point in time was speeding songs up. It's an old top 40 trick. Hundreds and play hundreds more of more music. Artists. Yeah, we, we'll play more music. Faster. I mean, Springsteen even sped up Hungry Heart. Just, you know, it, it, whatever. So, this particular song, Alabama Getaway, it sounded, Jerry and, and the band, they sounded like chipmunks. It was, it was just so blatantly obvious. And Scott, <laughs> Fats, are you listening to what Burger's doing to your band? Now, I don't know what the punchline was to it, but I guess they, I, I think you were doing something with PLJ and the Grateful Dead, and boy, did that put a bug in Scott's bonnet. He just, that was, but like I say, you were able to, you were a businessman, there's no question about it, but at the same time, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, but you never burned the friendship. Well, listen, it was hard. I mean, Scott had a heart of gold. You know, there were, as with all of us, there were some downsides, uh, but, but, uh, I remember now. I wouldn't have remembered this, but now that you said it, what happened was PLJ was sort of this mixture of an AOR station and but played top 40 stuff, and Alabama Getaway was a so Grateful Dead had very very few few hit singles, but that was but, but that was becoming one, and Scott wouldn't play Alabama Getaway. He played the album, mm -hmm. but there were other songs in the album he wouldn't he wouldn't play, or at least a single version he wouldn't play. Yes, you know that was what it is. It was a single version. And uh, uh, PLJ was playing it. This became my fault. 
this became, you know, with Scott, any of you know Scott, you know, this, somebody had to be making the mistake. It was never Scott. So, uh, you never th had it so good. Yeah, this, you know, this, this became my, my fault that they were playing it. And I, I really had to go to the dead's attorney and we had to, you know, have a, 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 a cease and desist letter and, uh, you know, speeding it up, you know, inappropriate when Arista got into it, Clive Davis, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we got into a whole thing. Larry Berger, it turns out, was a very nice guy. He was the, Scott's counterpart of PLJ, but, but he, he didn't, didn't have get the it. Personality. He didn't have the personality, and he no. didn't get it. And he didn't have, there were some great jocks there, mm. but, uh, and some who ended up, I guess, on AEW. Sure, you know, don't but, have to but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I was able to go. Now, look, a lot of that had to do with Mel Carmazan, who, by the way, you know, half the year lives down here in uh, Spring Lake, or one of the rich places down here. Uh, and, uh, it's going to be renamed Mel soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mel was a guy who, who uh, really held my hand, and uh, um, he loved it, because no, everybody was scared of Scott. The staff was scared shitless of, 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 of Scott. So he loved it when I, you know, when I went after Scott a little bit. Um, but I would have loved to have been privy to your calls with agents because <laughs> you actually knew what you're doing and they were used to just having their way with people that didn't, like a Frank Barcelona who did represent the Who and Cream and all yep. these. He was one of the first well, you know, agents. Yeah, he's on that very, very short list with, with, with really Mel. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't have been, ever been able to have the career that I had without, without Frank. He was um, you know, and he, he, supported, he supported the opening of the Capitol um, from the moment it was mentioned, uh, and and uh, um, and supported Asbury. He he didn't usually book a lot of acts with Mo back in the you know in the '60s um, because he didn't think Mo knew what he was doing. Um, but he he embraced it, and you know in those days, you know before I started, it, this started in the '60s. Frank Barcelona owned a company called Premier Talent, and it was far and away the most important booking agency yep. in the world. Uh, and and uh, uh, the industry worked in a certain way because Frank created it that way. He basically gave people franchises that knew what they were doing. If you could convince Frank that you knew what you were doing, you knew where all the head shops were, you knew where the college radio stations that people listened to, you knew all the nitty gritty of, of, of your market, Frank would award you a franchise, all right? And, and literally, and my franchise was, you know, was Jersey. Uh, and and uh, you kept that franchise forever unless you screwed up. And I'd give you a whole list of people who screwed up. Um, but uh, like like these guys said, we were all about the same age. And the important the important agents, uh, to a large degree, were at least ten years older than we were. There were there were no adults in the music business. All right when. When, when um, things happened in the 50s and 60s, I don't know this by reading and, and talking to people, uh, you know, it was Dick Clark, it was Murray Decay, it was Alan Freed, all these legendary guys, but they were grown-ups, you know. Uh, you know, the audiences were teeny boppers to a large degree, but, they, you know, they were grown-ups. But once uh, uh, music started becoming more, rock music started <coughs> becoming more sophisticated, um, you know, in the late 60s and in the early 70s, the people who were running the record companies, the radio stations, and the agencies didn't have a clue what was happening. Not a clue, because they all thought it was a fad, just like my parents did, you know? Picture uh, the, the classic cigar-chomping guy with the white shoes, yes, right? Yes, yes, ab <laughs> ab ab absolutely. And, and, and so, um, you know, we, I was in the right place at the right time and, and helped create sort of you know, this, this, this business with people who knew what they were talking about. But yet I was a good 10 years younger than, you know, I was 20 years younger than Bill Graham, 10, 12 years younger than Ron Delsner, 10 years younger than Larry Maggot, um, a lot of, you know, so uh, I was the kid for a, long, for a long time. Listen, I see some of the old timers now that I still get referred to as the kid. Uh, you know, uh, so, so it was, yeah, you too, absolutely. Um, so it was, it was wild times because we were, we were helping to create an industry, um, which eventually, and really the time it, it happened was in, in, in 1970, when, not when Woodstock happened, which happened in 69, when the movie came out of Woodstock. 
and was an enormous, enormous commercial hit. All right, all the older guys at CBS and at Time Warner, and it was just Warner's then at the time, like the light bulb went off in her and I said, holy shit. You know, there's, there's, there's money real there. money to be made there. All right. By that time, you know, it was, it, it, that was just when I was starting. But the guys I just told you, they had been doing it for 10 years or five years, you know, whatever. So, you know, it stayed a young man's business for a long, for a long time. And, and the industry grew because of that. I just want to say one last thing and I'll shut up. Um, the reason I immediately loved John Shearer, and I think there's an unwritten code amongst music lovers where you recognize a music lover as soon as you encounter them. There is, there's just something that it's almost in your DNA or something. And I knew immediately when I met John that he was a music lover and there was a liked soul. And I think that's why people here love him so much and why, um, you know, he did such a great job for Jersey. For they, didn't know, they, they didn't all love him. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There was a couple of little yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a marquee in the back here. I don't know if everyone's seen it. Hopefully they have. A beautiful marquee from uh, Springsteen's uh, Darkness on the Edge Town Tour. Um, was that the only time that a special marquee was made like that? Is that really unique? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, in, the, in those days, marquees were, you know, letters that you popped on to, yeah. you know, on, onto it. Um, right. But this was, Bruce had exploded. And, you know, this was his sort of, at the time, you know, his, his tribute to coming back to Jersey to play the Capitol. So, um, you know, we, we made that, and that just around the time... Actually, it was made by a guy named Arlen Schumer, who Is may he be here? here tonight. Is yeah, he here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you take it back? Ah, yeah. oh, there you go. Okay. Great. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if Arlen remembers or not, but there was, it was the first sort of conflict that I had with John Landau, who was just then uh, Bruce's manager, in that um, the guys in the band... Uh, were, were real, you know, they, they were real friends, you know, some of them real friends. Uh, when Max became in the band, Max and my wife Sherry, who's here's best friend, he was her girlfriend in high school. Uh, uh, she was his girlfriend in high school. And when I first, first